I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Paul Jaffe, an electronics engineer and researcher at the Naval Center for Space Technology at the U.S. Naval Research Lab. In over 25 years at the NRL, he's worked on dozens of space missions for a range of defense and civilian agency sponsors. Dr. Jaffe earned his PhD in electrical engineering at the University of Maryland, College Park, and served as a coordinator of two studies of the military applications of space-based solar power, and as an editor of the study group's final reports. He was the principal investigator for a four-year groundbreaking research effort involving the development and testing of modules for the conversion of sunlight into microwaves, which is currently in orbit on the X-37B space plane. He joins us today to discuss the technological opportunities and challenges for space-based beam solar power, simply known as space solar. So, Paul, welcome, sir. Thank you so much for your time as well as for your many years of service. Thanks, Tim, I appreciate the opportunity. So today we're discussing space-based solar power. So let me ask for a brief description, kind of a big picture idea to help our audience understand where you're coming from on this. Absolutely, space solar is collecting the abundant sunlight of space and sending it to the earth wherever it is needed. It has the advantage over ground-based solar in that in space, you can put a spacecraft where it will be in sun almost all the time, rather than having to deal with nighttime as you would on Earth. And of course, there's no clouds or rain or, or other kinds of atmospheric weather in space. So there's a lot more sunlight that you can collect. And then the big advantage is you can send it kind of wherever you need it. You can send it to a developing country, a place that's been hit with a disaster and has no infrastructure or really anywhere that it's needed to help with grid balancing or providing power to remote areas. Ah, okay. Now it's interesting. You're, you're actually mentioning a couple of things that I hadn't that hadn't occurred to me. So I maybe we drill down on those. But so one of the things I, I when I was doing research for this here on Earth, there are already dozens of industrial scale solar farms. Many of them in the United States, lots in China, as well as several other countries. They're generating hundreds, sometimes thousands of megawatts of power. So you'd mentioned that you have more access to sunlight in space. Um, you probably also have more sunlight because it doesn't have to go through the atmosphere, right? Indeed. Um, and now, you'd also mentioned that you can send this to multiple locations. That was something that I wasn't aware of. Uh, from what I'd understood, from what I've read in the past, you have so you you have the the collector in space. You have your solar panels. It converts it into microwaves, and then it beams it to a ground station. But is there a way to do mobile stations for this? Let me mention uh, that the conversion for power beaming could be microwaves or it could be optical. So there's a couple different choices there, depending on the impl implementation. And it's important to recognize that the idea is not new. It's been around at least since 1941 when Isaac Asimov wrote about it in the science fiction story uh, Reason. And it's been explored in the intervening time by a lot of folks. Uh, that said, it's only fairly recently that the various component technologies have evolved to a point where we can really dig into what the architectures would look like. So definitely some proposed architectures use microwaves, some of them use geosynchronous orbit, some of them use other orbits. There's definitely also proposals for using laser power beaming in the optical range in a range of different orbits. There are some physics limitations on the sizes of the transmitter and receiver that depend on the wavelength you pick for the power beaming. Ah, okay. Well, so again, one of the, the big differences between ground-based and space-based solar is how to get that power back onto the grid, right? And we just touched yeah. on that. So in a traditional solar farm, you just wire it in, you're good to go. You know, I, I, I know there's conversion and stuff like that involved, but it's, it's physically connected. With, with space-based, you talked about microwave, you talked about optical. Um, what kind of losses do you think are typically involved with that? Uh, so, so before I answer that, let me point out a, a couple things that are important to keep in mind. So, so ground-based solar is fantastic. And I just have to, to, uh, to emphasize how amazing photovoltaic technology is, right? Like, like it is almost magical. If you put a solar panel in the sunlight and it generates electricity, there's no fuel, 
there's no like once you've got it in place like you're just getting electricity for decades until that panel uh stops working uh which really might take many decades uh of course our terrestrial solar farms don't generate any electricity at night and uh there's really only like the middle of the day when they're putting out their maximum amount because of that on the grid you have to have something that can serve when it is not sunny and that either necessitates other sources of energy or some kind of storage the nice thing about space solar is because most of the proposed concepts have the satellites in sunlight uh, on the order of 99 percent of the time you need much less storage for a much shorter period of time and you can treat it as what's called a base load power source rather than an intermittent one as we see with a lot of the renewables like terrestrial solar and wind and the like so the idea that it's available essentially 24 7 is very powerful now you asked about efficiency there's a couple things to consider uh, a lot of people point to existing solar panels and they say ah oh, you know they're still only like 20 ish percent efficient like why would we bother and it's like well again you're getting electricity without any fuel like basically for free once you have installed it for decades right so the same is going to apply for space solar important to recognize that in most cases the sunlight that you're capturing with space solar otherwise probably wouldn't have hit the earth at all so anything you get is is basically free at that point now efficiency is something people focus on a lot because it's easy to understand right like if you know if something is 100 percent efficient it is twice as good as something that is 50 percent efficient however i would contend that both for terrestrial solar and for space solar efficiency is is important to look at but it's not the be-all end-all for considerations right in particular for space solar the thing that has hold, held it back like i mentioned the idea has been around for a long time you may say reasonably well why don't we have it already and the reason for that is principally based on economics right it's been for most of the space age very expensive to put things in space and that's only changing now in the last like seven or eight years as we see companies like spacex actually like reusing rockets like they have some rockets they've used like oh, well over uh 10 times and they're not the only ones blue origin is also reusing rockets so this is a really big game changer because it means that the cost of access to space is going to come down because you're not basically throwing the rocket away every time the, the analogy that's made is like we would not have an airline industry if after every flight you threw the plane away right that would be uh expensive and impractical so so space access is improving and that helps with the economics for something like space solar you still have to look for space solar at how much it does cost to put the mass in space, how much it costs to manufacture that technology that you're going to put in space. And that's another area where recently we've seen a lot of improvement, right? So uh, for again, for most of the space age, satellites have been like hand assembled by technicians in a clean room and like there's a lot of testing and there's a lot of inspection and a lot of like touch labor and like things that are intricate and all it's almost like artisans making something we are now in an era where satellites are more being made with the mass production technologies that have been proven in other industries for a very long time so when you see a company like Starlink launch 60 some satellites in like a big stack like those were not hand assembled like there was a lot of automated assembly that went into that and that's the case for a lot of the new constellations that we're seeing that are putting up hundreds or thousands of satellites this really brings down the cost of space hardware so you can think about this in kind of terms of four different parameters and hopefully not getting too technical here but if you think about the the cost of access to space for a given kilogram it's going to cost a certain amount to put it up there to manufacture whatever that is for a given kilogram it's going to cost a certain amount and then for whatever you put in space you can expect to get some amount of power down for the amount of mass you put in space and then there's going to be a lifetime like if you can put this up there and it lasts for many decades again it's like printing money because once it's in place there's no fuel you're just getting the energy so if you look at these four factors launch cost per unit mass hardware cost per unit mass what i call what we call specific power the watts per unit mass and the lifetime you can get a cents per kilowatt hour figure 
familiar to many of those who pay electric bills or you look at your electric bill, the way they charge you is how many kilowatt hours did you use that month and how many cents are you paying per kilowatt hour for that? So uh, if we focus on those four factors rather than efficiency, it makes more sense to evaluate space solar for its economic feasibility. Yeah, yeah. Well, and one of the really nice things about this is you can kind of amortize this out too, right? And there are costs to put this in orbit, but since it's generating power and that power is going to the grid and being sold, you were able to say, okay, well, if we put this up, it will pay us back in X amount. And that gives us more funds to put up, you know, more solar. And Absolutely. It, the, the other part that, that I've been reading about lately is these tremendous advances in the efficiency of photovoltaic cells also. So that, that's really exciting. Yeah, and it's worth pointing out that those photovoltaic efficiencies, that is the least efficient part of this chain, right? So uh, power beaming has been demonstrated back in the 70s with greater than 50% end-to-end -end efficiency. So that's like DC in to DC out. And even today, like the best research cells are 40 some percent efficient. And if you buy photovoltaics for space, they'll be like in, in the thirties or so. Uh, important to recognize the cells we use for space are different in important ways than the ones we use on the ground, which are principally silicon based. The ones we use in space are usually multi-junction cells and that allows them to be more efficient. As you pointed out earlier, because sunlight in space does not have to go through the atmosphere there is actually more of it, like it is more intense, like you get close to 1400 watts per square meter in space, whereas generally the best you're going to do at noon in the desert on the best day of the year is going to be on the order of 1000 watts per square meter. So there's like up to, up to 40% more in space, and then you're getting that 24 seven instead of just at like the best part of the day. Yeah. So, uh, one way to, to look at this or compare this is you, you can say like for a given spot on earth, like if you had a square meter, how much energy could you harvest there over the course of the year? And then you can compare that to the same square meter in space. How much energy could you harvest over that over the course of the year? And depending on where on earth you're comparing it to, because obviously some places are better for solar than others, that factor could be on the order of uh, five to 20. So it's a pretty significant difference depending on where you're comparing it with. Awesome. So I, I wanted to touch on Europe for a moment because they're in an energy crisis due to the Russian gas shortage. So Germany has even gone back to burning coal to keep the lights on. And in fact, I just read a story yesterday, they're actually going to start mining coal again. With that, that kind of surprised me. Um, could space-based solar be the clean green solution that we need for large scale needs like Europe right now? It's possible. Like uh, obviously future predictions are, are difficult to make because markets change, technologies change. So I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that it is the one true solution, uh, but it certainly could be a factor. It could be part of a collection of solutions. And I, I like to uh, to recall, you know, so so a lot of things do take time to develop, right? So like today, in many parts of the world, it is cheaper to put up a solar farm than it is to put up a coal plant for a variety of, of uh, local factors. Uh, solar has been around also for many decades, right? So it, it, it didn't get that to that place where it's cheaper than coal overnight. Uh, it took a lot of tech development, it took refinement. In some cases, it did take government incentives to uh, spur the market. And space solar, I would anticipate, would likely unfold in a similar way, where it would be shocking to me if it was cost competitive, like out of the gate. Like I suspect it would take some refinement and some technology development, much like ground-based solar did, much like many technologies take. Uh, even if you look at like something that is uncontroversially um, a, a leading technology with great benefits, satellite communications, like that started out like extremely uncompetitive from a cost basis, right? Like the first phone call that was connected across the Atlantic cost many orders of magnitude more than even a call over undersea cable would have cost at the time. But that did not mean that we shouldn't have investigated that and that the government shouldn't have made the investments and laid the groundwork so that now communication satellites and satellite telephony and other kinds of satellite communications are 
used all over the world and it's the most lucrative business there is in space. So it's important to, to have the right expectation, I think, for how space solar might perform uh, from an economic basis before uh, setting the, the threshold too high or too low. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, it's important for people to understand that this isn't theory. I mean, obviously, there are solar farms on Earth already adding to the grid, right? They're already putting energy on the grid. In space, you would mentioned the X-37 space plane is, is currently up there in a mission testing this. Yeah, we are fortunate to have an experiment on the X-37B orbital test vehicle. It was launched in May 2020. We built a sunlight to microwave conversion module. This sought to get this key question. I mentioned the four things, the cost of launch, cost of hardware, specific power, and orbital lifetime. And the specific power is kind of the, the key one, and it is the one where efficiency ties in, right? If you have a unit that is more efficient, you'll have a higher specific power. You'll get more power down per unit mass. So what we said is we said, okay, a lot of interesting claims out there. Let us build a sunlight to microwave converter and see what specific power we can achieve with today's technology in a quick and cheap way without doing, uh, a, basically using off the shelf parts. So we built that. Uh, these things take a little while to get manifested and get launched, but we went through that process that launched in May of 2020. We are getting data from that experiment that shows the thermal performance, the power conversion performance, and a number of other metrics of interest. And we are using that to inform the next generation design. So it is key to meet economic thresholds to get that specific power as high as practically feasible. And oh, okay. uh, by increasing that, so if um, I know people usually like shy away when you start doing equations, but if you have if you have the cost of launch, cost of hardware, specific power, and the time of operation, uh, these things cancel out the mass, and you end up with the cents per kilowatt hour figure. So it's actually fairly straightforward. So by increasing that specific power, you show how far or close you might be to getting to a point where it's going to be cost effective for a given application. This is probably a good time to mention that like what so if if you live in a industrialized country and you're connected to the grid, you're probably paying between 5 and 20 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity nowadays. Not everybody is so fortunate, right? If you are on a remote island or in a place that doesn't have a grid or has very limited infrastructure, you're probably paying much more per unit of energy per kilowatt hour than folks who are connected to the grid. And I, as you mentioned at the outset, work for the Naval Research Laboratory. And one thing we look at is the cost of energy resupply for military operations. For a long time, we've had operations in places that don't have a lot of infrastructure or we don't have any expectation that we could just like plug in to recharge stuff. And a lot of times to do operations, you have a generator and then delivering the fuel for that generator is a huge undertaking. It has to be shipped across the sea maybe, and then put on trucks, and then maybe put on a helicopter and maybe relayed somewhere. And by the time it gets to where you need it, you're definitely not paying 10, 10 cents a kilowatt hour. You might be paying many dollars, maybe even upwards of $50 a kilowatt hour. And if we could beam the energy straight to where it's needed to simplify this logistics, avoid the cost, avoid the risk to our people who oftentimes have been killed delivering fuel, that's really powerful. And that's an instance where even if it does cost some number of dollars per kilowatt hour to get it there, it might still be a better choice than the way we're doing it today. So, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned the X-37B up in orbit. I didn't realize that it was still in orbit. It, and that, that was why I kind of, you heard me vocalize that earlier. I know that it went up in May, 2020. I thought that it actually came down. Uh, about a year later, but it sounds like it's still been, it's still up. It's been up for about two years producing data then. Yeah, they've uh, historically, they've, they've typically flown it around two years, but they usually try to do a little bit longer each time than the previous time. Well, so one of the things that I wanted to ask about was since it's up in, I think it's in low earth orbit, right? How, how does this, well, I guess this experiment would also be prone, but larger scale solar farms, there might be issues with space debris, right? That's been kind of a growing concern. Um, how, how are you guys taking that into account, I guess? Yeah, really important question. The 
challenge of space debris is real and the worst place for space debris is in low earth orbit. There is also a space debris problem in geosynchronous orbit because we have a lot of satellites that have been up there over the course of the space age. But at least in geosynchronous orbit, the density of the debris is lower and the differential speed of the debris is also less of an issue. So it is in low earth orbit. There's a, so there's a region where if you get low enough, stuff like gets hit with atmospheric drag and the orbit decays and it burns up. Uh, but a little bit above that, uh, it just it's going to take a much longer time. So so it is a challenge. Um, most solar power satellite systems probably would not use low Earth orbit because you spend a lot of time in the shadow of the Earth. There are some exceptions you could conceivably use, like a sun synchronous uh, terminator orbit. Uh, but most solar power satellite architectures would be in a, a higher orbit, maybe something like GPS or geosynchronous or, or maybe a higher orbit. So while the space debris problem in low Earth orbit is of concern, it is less of a concern for an operational solar power satellite than it is for like actually getting to that orbit. And the nice thing about launch is like you don't spend that much time in low Earth orbit. So if there is like a real debris problem, as long as you can kind of make it through there, you'll be okay. Uh, that said, it is very important for our civilization to come up with good ways to minimize space debris and to mitigate the space debris that exists. So uh, that is a that is a real concern. It's not a showstopper for solar power satellites, but it is something that's for sure needs attention. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like you're basically just getting them high enough to get them out of the debris cloud, basically. Right. Yeah. Well, so the United States is not the only country that's experimenting with this. Uh, China is also very keen on space-based solar. And they've mentioned that they want to test a platform in LEO by 2028 and then geosynchronous orbit by 2030. How serious do you think China is on this? And are they ahead of us or behind us in developing this technology? So uh, speaking only to what I've read in the media, as, as you and, and likely your viewers have as well, China has been very ambitious in space. And in general, they have delivered pretty well, right? So important to keep in mind, like China to date is the only country that has put a probe at the Earth Moon L2 point, which they then use to communicate with their rover on the far side of the moon, something that no other country has done. So China definitely sets ambitious goals for space and has a record of achieving them. So while I don't know if they're going to hit their 2028 and 2030 goals, it's certainly not unreasonable to think that they might. And if they are able to do that, they could well be ahead of us. So uh, a lot of this really depends on political will. Like uh, you can compare it to the Apollo program from the 1960s, right? Where you, you had President Kennedy set out this very clear goal, put someone on the moon before the end of the decade. He built the support for it. Congress provided the funding. And it happened. It was a super ambitious project. The United States was able to accomplish it. So I have no doubt that if there was a national priority for something like space solar, that our country, uh, I, have, I have no doubt that we can make it happen. So, but it, I mean, it depends on on the will and the support and the priorities. And of course, there's there's plenty of priorities to go around. So it's uh, it's hard to say. Uh, I'll I'll just comment. Um, one of the reasons that I think this technology is important is because it does offer this path towards a country or company becoming effectively like the electrical power provider for the world, right? So like right now, uh, while we're trying to use less oil, oil is still like a huge factor in geopolitics and in energy policy around the world. And if you have a country like Saudi Arabia that has the ability to like adjust its capacity and its output, like that affects the whole market, right? Like they can change gas prices in the US by how much they produce. So imagine now if a country like dials in solar power satellite technology and they can provide energy like basically anywhere in the world to like any developing country to any country that's been hit with a natural disaster or has some kind of infrastructure catastrophe, that is a really powerful capability to have and it has huge implications for geopolitics. So a good question to ask is like, 
what countries would we want to have that power and that influence? Well, you know, politically also, this this seems like the kind of project that everyone can get behind. I mean, you know, the space industry obviously would benefit in, in so many different ways the space industry would benefit. But also, you know, in terms of renewable energy, I mean, solar is one of the big two, right? Wind and solar are the, the ones that the renewable community loves to promote. This is solar. So, you know, it, it seems like this is, it, it's one of those intersectional areas, I guess, that everyone could support. So hopefully that political will is there and continues to grow. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, it's a question of leadership too, right? I mean, so, so there's a couple, a couple models you can look at for how this might be developed. So uh, the U.S. developed GPS. This is something that's uh, near and dear to us here at NRL because it was the uh, technology for spaceborne atomic clocks that we developed. And then we built the first GPS satellite and a number of experimental satellites leading up to that. And now, of course, everyone takes GPS for granted. Like you have it in every phone and watch and GPS is just a thing that everybody has, right? Of course, it was not always like that. And it was because the US government and the Department of Defense made that investment and that GPS became a thing. A lot of people didn't want it. A lot of people thought it was a terrible idea because they're like, ah, oh, you know, we have these gyroscopes that are of higher precision than anyone else. Like if we do GPS, like now we're gonna be leveling the playing field. Uh, nonetheless, we have GPS and it's proved tremendously valuable, not just for defense, but for commercial operations, right? No GPS, uh, no Uber, no Lyft, right? Like there's like so many things that now GPS is just a uh, intrinsic uh, part of. And it's to the point where other countries like rightfully observe, they say, well, you know, we don't wanna be dependent on American GPS. So the Europeans are building Galileo, the Russians built GLONASS, Chinese are building Beidou, other countries are building their own satellite navigation systems because they see the value and the utility and they don't want to be dependent on American GPS. Similar thing could happen uh, for space solar. So that's that's one model. Uh, you mentioned that energy is of interest to everyone. And that's why if you look at a project like the ITER International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, which is a coalition of countries that you won't find cooperating on a lot of other things, right? It's uh, your US, European Union, Russia, China, India, Japan, South Korea. The like the only other place you might see these folks cooperating is like for like the World Cup or the Olympics or something, right? But they're cooperating for the development of fusion energy, which similar to space solar could have a revolutionary consequence for our civilization because it would change how we source energy. So people are cooperating on that. I think there is an opportunity for an eater like project for space solar for whoever is going to take the initiative to to lead it. You can also look at something like this International Space Station, right, which is likewise a collaboration of lots of different countries that decide to get together and share the cost and share the benefit of putting together a, a important piece of technology. Well, so let me ask about how much work and maintenance would be required to put one of these in orbit and maintain it, right? I mean, if, if we're looking at commercial scale uh, technologies, you know, obviously there, there is a launch cost. You'd mentioned that like SpaceX and others are able to bring that down very substantially. Uh, there's also a maintenance cost, right? I mean, if you've got this large art orbiting solar farm, you, you're going to have to have I, I'm assuming there are going to be panels that'll probably be, need to be replaced periodically, right? Do, have you guys done any estimates on what the cost might be for something like that? The maintenance cost will certainly depend on how you implement it, what orbit it's in, whether you use microwave power transmission or optical power transmission. These will all affect the size of the satellites, like different orbits have different amounts of space radiation, which will affect like how long the electronics and solar panels are likely to last. So we can certainly make estimates on that, but honestly, without like a sort of point design or a very specific architecture, uh, there's gonna be some uncertainty with that, right? So I am definitely of the mind at this point that like technology is for sure maturing. The work that we've done at NRL and the work that folks are doing around the world is advancing the state of the technology, particularly for power beaming which is of course a, a critical underlying technology for space solar. And that'll help inform and shape some of the architectures that get developed 
but there's still a, a lot of unknowns. You definitely can't ignore things like maintenance. It is worth noting that today, if you launch a communication satellite or another kind of satellite into space, like once it's in space, the maintenance is close to zero, right? Like it's gonna be up there for however many decades. And the thing that usually results in its end of life is just that it runs out of station keeping fuel. So, and we're actually working on that too, where we maybe we can refuel things. We can send up a, a servicing satellite to extend the lives of satellites that otherwise are perfectly good, but just have run out of station keeping fuel. So, so the maintenance might be, might be relatively small. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's. I think one of the valuable things to point out also is that space-based solar is important not only for sending power back to Earth, but we could also use that to send power to the moon, space stations, satellites, I mean, potentially all over the place. And so as the space industry continues to grow, right, and there are all of these ambitious projects taking shape right now, we can provide power to those, right? Indeed. Yeah. Well, and I think that's that's an important thing. Like power beaming and space solar often get conflated. And uh, you asked, like, is space solar going to be like a major factor in our energy future? I don't know. It it might be. It might not be. I can say with confidence that there are going to be a lot of scenarios where power beaming, totally apart from space solar, will almost certainly make sense. Right. So power beaming is just moving energy around without having to have a wire or to deliver fuel or batteries or something. Right. So. You can see how this would be effective if we're using drones for like everything now, right? So, but the, the limitation is battery runs out, got to land it, change out the battery. So if you could beam power to it and just keep it up, that opens up all kinds of possibilities for a whole range of applications. Certainly, like you say, on the moon and in space, if instead of having to deliver a fuel tank, we can just like beam power instead of having to like refuel the satellite, if we just beam power to it, that really changes the game. So I think power beaming technology is worth advancing for its own merits and also because it is just a critical enabler for space solar. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Paul, let me thank you for your time today. And again, thank you for your many years of federal service. So let me close by asking what comes next for your research and where can we expect to see space-based beam solar power next in the headlines? Oh, yeah. Well, so I, I wish I knew that. I can tell you uh, NRL is what we call a working capital organization, which means there's not like a federal budget line item that says, hey, NRL to do cool stuff. So we have to make proposals and we have to pitch projects to sponsors so that we get money to do them. And the next thing we do will depend on whether we can persuade sponsors that it is a worthy thing to do and that it's going to have a benefit for the nation. So so stay tuned on that. Uh, definitely, as I suspect you've seen, like there's a lot going on around the world. Even just la less than a month ago, there was a great power beaming demonstration uh, at Airbus conducted by the New Zealand company Emrod, which shows they're moving forward. The Chinese, of course, are always announcing exciting new developments and, and demonstrations. So, so the headline could come from, I think, a variety of places. Uh, you asked kind of what's what's next. I think one thing that would for sure need to be addressed for microwave power beaming is the question of spectrum allocation. And there's lessons here again from what happened with the development of communication satellites, where the government saw there was promise here. They passed the ComSat Act to set up a quasi corporation to help develop the technology and kind of get the industry stood up. The same thing could conceivably happen for space solar, maybe a, a SunSat Act. And some aspect of that would be international cooperation cooperation for things like spectrum, right? So the spectrum's full. So if you wanna use microwave power beaming, you're gonna to have to figure out where it fits and how it's gonna cooperate and coexist with existing users. And that's really important. And that is something that is gonna require a lot of synchronization, not just technology developers, but folks on the regulatory side. And of course, with any of this stuff, like no one is gonna be interested in it if it is unsafe or it jams their Wi-Fi. So uh, there's a lot of really important things that need to be addressed aside from the technology development that do need to happen. So I, I think a broad-based effort that addresses all these different factors is gonna be key if we're gonna see space solar truly move into its prime. Wonderful. Paul, thank you again so much, sir. Thank you, Tim.